So today I want to address the framework that I've created after years of working with dietitians one-on-one. -on -one. Now I've titled my framework intuitive living for dietitians, but I want to be clear right off the bat, and we'll get into this in even more detail in a second. You do not have to be an intuitive eating dietitian. You don't have to like intuitive eating. You don't have to know a darn thing about intuitive eating to benefit from this framework. Now, the way I created this was after two years of working with dietitians one-on-one -on -one and knowing that I was going to be building a group program, I wanted to create something a little bit more consistent. I wanted to take the lessons and the topics that I discussed with my one-on-one -on -one clients and look at their journeys, look at the process that they went through to get from where they started, usually burnt out, riddled with imposter thoughts, uh, not happy in their jobs, trying to find their place all the way to the end of feeling confident and connected to their work and fulfilled by their careers. And in order to do that, I started mapping out the different processes and, and something started to take shape that reminded me a lot of the intuitive eating framework. And from there, I developed 10 principles adopted from intuitive eating, or at least those principles inspired by those principles and created one to help you with your journey as a dietitian. Now, interestingly enough, since then, I've started to see this come up in a few different spaces uh, with other intuitive eating dietitians who work in professional development. I've seen 10 principles of intuitive entrepreneurship. I've seen 10 principles of intuitive dietetics. I've seen so many uh, iterations of this, and I love it. I want to pause and kind of say like, why, why are we seeing so much of this? And what it really comes down to is that as intuitive eating practitioners, we have found the framework so inspiring and we've realized that intuitive eating itself is not about eating. It's supposed to be freeing. It's supposed to expand our world. And that's what we found as we ourselves have gone through this process. We've discovered that it's opened our world up because intuitive eating at its core is about divesting ourselves of all the external noise that we hear and tuning back into our inner wisdom. It's being able to integrate rational thought and research and knowledge and insight into our emotional intuitive experience, right? And even just from that sentence, I think we can see how far reaching that core concept can really be and how much potential it can have in all different areas of our lives. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that I'm not the only one talking about this. Now, the different professionals who are creating these riffs on the 10 principles, we all do it a little bit differently. My 10 principles are not the same as someone else's. And I think it's so cool to see how we can take something that we were trained in as professionals and then turn it into something that helps us in our professional lives outside of our work with clients. It helps us with our personal lives. It it just becomes so much more expansive. And that's what I really wanted was I wanted something that opened our world up as dietitians that helped us achieve and overcome all of the noise and the barriers and the stresses that come our way. There was a part of me that was nervous labeling it intuitive living and aligning with intuitive eating because as passionate as I am about intuitive eating, I am a certified intuitive eating counselor. It is how I practice with my nutrition clients. I've been adamant from the start that supervision and getting support as a dietitian can't and shouldn't be restricted to one area of practice or to one type of work. And I wanted to make sure that 
if I was labeling an intuitive living that you did not have to be intuitive eating to benefit from it. And so if you're not an intuitive eating dietitian, I hope you'll stay with me. I hope you'll listen to all 10 principles and give it a chance because I think you'll see that you don't have to be an intuitive eating dietitian to benefit, right? Because that's, that's the crux of this. There's support out there for some groups of dietitians, but not all. For example, if you are a private practice dietitian, if you own your own business, there is a good amount of support out there for you. And I love that. I love how many different business coaches are out there. And you really have your pick. I mean, there is an ocean to choose from. You can get so specific about what you want to be coached on. Are you an intuitive eating dietitian and you want to specifically hire a coach who specializes in intuitive eating practices? You can find that. Do you want to take insurance? You can find a coach for that. Do you want to learn how to uh, scale to a group practice or a group program? There are coaches for that. Do you not want to work with clients one-on-one? You want to have a business that has different outcomes. Absolutely, there are coaches for that too. And yet at the same time, not every single one of us wants to open up our own business. And there are pitfalls to business coaches too. They're not a panacea for all of our problems. I did a podcast episode last summer uh, titled, Should You? And should is in quotes. Should you hire a uh, business coach? And it's really outlining the pros and cons of business coaching and where some of their limitations tend to be to make sure that if you are in business, that is the right support for you right? To make sure that that is what you need. And then for all of the people listening, all the dietitians listening who don't need business coaching, well, then what? Or you've tried business coaches and they don't really seem to be addressing the issues that you're struggling with, right? Another area that uh, tends to have a little bit more support in it is the eating disorder space, Supervision within dietetics is much more common in eating disorders. In fact, the only that I know of that I've been able to find the only official certification and training to be like a formal supervisor is a certified eating disorder supervisor. And that's a problem because there are so many dietitians outside of the eating disorder space that deserve supervision, right? And I will say one of the reasons that eating disorder dietitians tend to be more familiar with supervision because it tends to be more common in that space is because supervision really came from mental health uh, professions. They're the ones that incorporate this regularly into their practice. And because eating disorder dietitians tend to work very closely with therapists, they tend to borrow more from their frameworks, their approaches, their professional practice. And so supervision has become a more common practice there. You're also taking on a whole lot of emotions and projection and everything, <laughs> counter-transference, transference, all of the good stuff when you're in working with that population in particular. So again, it makes sense. But again, I believe that every single dietitian out there deserves support, whether you work in clinical, community, private practice, whether you're in eating disorders, intuitive eating, everything. You all deserve support. And so the framework that I designed is meant for that. You can tell me that I'm not niched down all day if you want. I stand strong in this belief that support is out there for all of us. Now, another thing that I want to say about the framework before I actually introduce the principles is that two things, actually. The first is that this is going to evolve over time. My 10 principles of intuitive living are going to evolve the same way that the principles of intuitive eating have evolved over time. I want to say, I don't have it in front of me. I want to say the first edition of intuitive eating came out in 1995. And there are four editions now. 
And you better believe that the verbiage that they use in the titles of the principles, the research that they use to support each principle, the way that they talk about the principles, the examples that they use, all of these things change over time because we learn more, because we ourselves evolve. And I fully anticipate my own intuitive living framework to change. Even now, as I record this, I am a few months into my first group cohort and I'm learning how I need to tweak things for future groups. Because remember, I built this off of a one-on-one framework where I worked with dietitians one-on-one and now I'm bringing it into the group space and I'm learning more about what order I want the principles to go in. Although we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, I'm learning about the language of them. And certainly as more research comes out, we're starting to see more and more research on, for example, dietitian burnout specifically. When I first started, that wasn't really out there very much. So as I learn more as a practitioner, as we learn more as a society, as a profession, these will evolve. And that's okay. That's a beautiful thing. So certainly if things change over time, I'll update, I'll create a new podcast episode and tell you all about the research and the reasons why maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I learned something. Maybe I improved my skill set. Who knows what's going to happen in the future. So I welcome you along for the ride as I figure things out too. Now, what I mentioned just now, this idea of what order I teach the principles in I want to be very clear. I do not teach from a linear process. That's not how we learn. And that's not how I work with my dietitians. Now I do teach somewhat linearly, kind of, and I'm going to be talking about them today a little bit linearly, just for the sake of organization and to make sure that you're clear on it. But if you know anything about me, If you listened to my podcast episode from the end of January, you know that I'm all about cycles, right? And just as the world around us operates in cyclical ways, just as though, just as our energy flows through us cyclically, we learn in cycles, right? And so we tend to think, and we're going to talk a little bit about this in principle one, the idea of like growth and progress as like, I'm constantly learning and I'm constantly growing. And we know as dietitians, when working with clients and patients, that that's usually not how that works. And we're no different. No, what happens? We start learning and then we like hit a roadblock and then we have a setback and come back and then we push forward again. And maybe we get a little farther and then we have another setback, right? And rather than thinking again about these like pushes and these setbacks as going in a linear line in a straight direction, right? I want you to think about a spiral. I wasn't the one that came up with the spiral concept, but it is something that I believe very strongly in when we're doing work on in professional development is that it's not that you are, uh, going forward and then taking steps back. It's more that you're going forward, learning something new, and then circling back to where you had gotten stuck before and applying all of these new insights and this new knowledge and these new skills to that situation so that you can propel yourself forward. And then you're going to learn something new and you're going to circle back again, right? And so when I teach these principles, Yes, I'm going to introduce one at a time, but we have to go back and revisit. We have to circle back all the time. So we talk about principle one and you learn something new. And then we introduce principle two and we circle back and say, this is how this relates to principle one. And you learn a deeper understanding, right? You go a little bit deeper. And it's in that way that we actually grow. Sometimes it feels like you're not making much progress, right? Sometimes it feels like you, you're like going and then you hit a wall and then you have to like wait until you learn a new skill or something else changes. You get some new insight so that then you can like come back and apply it. And it feels tedious and it feels slow. 
And those are uncomfortable feelings and uncomfortable things. And yet they are such an integral, unavoidable part of being human, right? So again, just keep that in mind as we go through these principles that everything is interwoven. And I will do my best to separate them out to make it clear as I walk you through them. Uh, but it's messy. Growth is messy. Professional development is messy. Recovery from burnout and imposter thoughts. It's all messy. So I want you to lean into that and practice being okay with that. I know it's tough for us type A dietitians. So with all of that being said, let's actually dive in to the principles. And I also want to say to everyone watching me on video, I am like battling the sunlight here. So we're hoping that we can get through this before the sun goes down and I'm like plunged into darkness. You ready? All right. Principle one, reject the hustle mentality. This one I've talked a little bit about. Uh, if you go back to my end of January episode, I believe it's episode 75. Um, I talk a lot about hustle. I talk a lot about slowness and our mentality and things like that. And uh, those thoughts are very much inspired by the work that I do with dietitians in this space. What this principle is all about is recognizing all of the different factors that influence our opinions, our beliefs, our choices, our experiences. It's basically how did we get to be who we are today, where we are today, what we believe in today? Now, one of the things that we internalize from an early age is this concept of the hustle. This concept of we have to be working on ourselves and achieving and growing and working hard and pushing ourselves, right? Keeping busy. What do we learn from that? What is a result? What are some of the things we internalize from the hustle mentality? It's things like perfectionism. It's like imposter thoughts and self-doubt. Fear of money and not having enough. It's a drive to constantly like be our best selves things like burnout. How much of this sounds familiar? There is a lot that we have to dig into with the systems that we live in. We have to understand the culture that we are raised in. All of these things are so pivotal for shaping our work ethic the how we look at ourselves, how we talk to ourselves, how we think about our self-worth what we value, what we don't, how we define success, right? And part of the preliminary work that we have to do as dietitians, if we want to overcome imposter thoughts, if we don't want perfectionism to paralyze us, if we either want to recover from burnout or want to avoid burnout altogether, it's that we have to become aware of external messages and influences we have to understand which of those messages and influences continue to serve us and which ones don't. And then we have to be able to tune back into our inner messaging. This is not unlike principle one of intuitive eating. Again, like I said, you don't have to embrace intuitive eating, but it is helpful to draw that parallel if you are into it. Um, basically, what principle one in intuitive eating is all about is becoming aware of all of the messaging that has shaped how we think about food, how we think about our bodies, how we think about our self-confidence, uh, how we value each other and ourselves, all of these things, right? And we have to learn to be able to kind of like cut out that noise and tune into our inner experience and figure out what's right for us as individuals. That's, that's going to be the key to all of this. So this is something that I do with all of my clients. 
I don't care if you're in my group. I don't care if you're in my one-on-one. We do the work here. We start here. And there are specific uh, activities, journal prompts, reflections, uh, things that we do to get you started in this space to really help you understand what messages did you internalize from your undergraduate experience, from your internship, from the profession as a whole? What influence did your professors, your advisors, your mentors, your preceptors have on you? Go back earlier than that. What did you learn from your childhood about work ethic and drive and ambition and success and what your worth is and how it's measured? What did you learn about your communication skills and your assertiveness and boundaries? All of these things influence who we are, how we got here, and the struggles that we're facing today. And this work is absolutely necessary if we want to reclaim our confidence, our passion, and our purpose. And if we want to build a life and a career on our own terms, which is something I hear from dietitians all the time. And so I do want to pause here and say that for the first time ever, I'm offering this in a free workshop. I'm taking the preliminary work that I do with my paid clients, my, the dietitians I supervise, and I am offering it in a workshop for free in March uh, for any dietitian who's feeling stuck, who's feeling lost, I hear dietitians say that they're feeling directionless a lot. Are you overwhelmed? Are you unhappy? If you're feeling like you're not in charge of your life as a dietitian, or that the work that you're doing isn't fulfilling, if you're struggling with imposter thoughts and overwhelm, this workshop is for you. And I would love to have you there. Like I said, I'm opening the doors, giving you a sneak peek into what it's like. And we can start laying this foundation so that you can gain clarity and really get to the bottom of what you believe in, you as an individual, versus what you've been told all of your life to believe. So I hope you'll join me with that.